Digitally Accessible. Digital Accessibility Simplified. So today's presentation is titled Silver Bullets. And the reason for that is, well, there's a world of silver bullets out there when it comes to accessibility, and we're all reaching for them, and for good reason. There's real consequences behind having inaccessible websites and apps, which we've already spoken about this morning in, in the, on, our, on our talks. And those consequences can actually have to be severe and expensive. Um, I'm involved as expert witness on the, some cases here in Canada at the moment, and I'll talk about those later. Um, retrofitting accessibility when these issues come up, when you start getting demand letters, can be very expensive and difficult. And as has already been said in previous talks, there's a shortage of skilled developers and accessible design and development to go and fix these problems when they occur. And the result is everybody lives a silver bullet. Everybody's looking for a quick fix for their accessibility. And it's a challenge because generally speaking, there are many silver bullets out there. Yet there are those legal consequences. So just going through a few almost at random, here in Ontario, where we are based with DA, we have the AODA, which is the um, Accessibility for Ontarian the Disability Act. Um, in Canada as a whole, there's the Accessible Canada Act, which is about to start. And we also have the Human Rights Act. Um, the Accessible Canada Act, you complain to your local provincial government um, when you find an accessibility issue with a website that you're trying to access. With the human right, human right, sorry, with the human rights act, which is for um, federal national issues, uh, uh, federal federally regulated um, industries, um, you actually sue and you go to the human rights court. And I'll be talking about that in a moment. In Quebec, Quebec has its own version of the AODA. In the United States, we have the ADA, which everybody thinks about, and there's a a Californian version of the ADA. That's why there's more court cases in California than anywhere else, because they have the their own ver local version of the of the ADA. There's also the Communications and Video Accessibility Act, which people are less familiar with. It's the one that hits the computer games industry, and the Communications and Video Accessibility Act is much more like our AODA here in Canada than the ADA. With the ADA. You go to court, you sue the company that you can't access. Communications and Video Accessibility Act, again, you complain to the federal government and the federal government investigates and finds the businesses concerned. Um, that's very popular with the games industry because it keeps them away from the courts and it gives a re it keeps them away from sort of the drive-by lawsuits that are going on. So out of the two in the United States, the one that's actually working best in terms of obvious improvements in accessibility is that Communications and Video Accessibility Act. And if you look at computer games five years ago and today, there's a massive difference in the quality of the games in terms of accessibility. And a lot of that is down to companies trying to make that Communications and Video Accessibility Act actually work, as nobody wants to end up with the ADA. Outside in the wider world, there's Australia has its Disability Discrimination Act, Japan has X. 8341 in the United Kingdom says the Equality Act 2000. When you start looking, well, what do I mean by a silver bullet? It comes with many names. We talk about automated remediation. We talk about adaptation using AI. We talk about built to use, pre built user profiles. So you can say, ah, you, you, you appear to be tabbing with the, with the um, keyboard, oh, maybe you're a screen reader user, will adapt to be a screen reader user. There's automated accessibility testing. So if anyone's ever seen the Axe development tools or even Lighthouse inside Google, inside Google Chrome, um, it's that kind of automated accessibility testing we're talking about there. Then there's automated regression testing because the kind of automated tests that you see inside, inside Lighthouse, inside Axe, are also available on an API basis. So as you're checking in source code, as you're maintaining source code, you can automatically run those tests as part of the check-in process. And then there's accessibility metrics because everybody likes numbers. And the image on the right-hand side of the screen is from Centennial College, which is one of the local colleges in Toronto. And it's showing me the Lighthouse scores below. And it's showing a score of 73 for their own website. 
And the first question you have to ask is, what on earth is, does 73 actually mean? And the answer is 73% of the tests that Google has chosen to run. And that's all that's actually telling you. And that's another problem that we have, that we go to these silver bullets and every, every automated regression testing tool, every individual company have different ways of scoring these things and it's very difficult to compare and contrast. So again, we run to these things <clears throat> as silver bullets. None of them are really silver bullets. Most of them are done by most accessibility. And certainly the, the bottom three we do here at DA as well. So I'm saying we can't really run out and find a silver bullet. We have, those tools are helpful, but what can we do in addition? And now there's maybe a little bit of body armor. We can't actually shoot our vampires. Maybe we can protect ourselves from them a little bit. So what I have on screen here is a screenshot from our own accessibility auditing tool that we use within DA. And the tabs that go across the top, there's the main info, which describes the, the issue itself. There's a tab for updating it. There's a tab for attachments and tasks and external and internal comments. But the one that I'm interested in is one of the tabs on the right-hand side, which is our activity log. So every time some work is done on, on, a, on an individual audit, on an individual ticket, we record the time that was logged and who did it and when. And you think, well, that's yeah, yes, obviously, but why? Why is that important? And the answer is what happens when those demand letters land on your desk? They, it may be that you end up in court. And when you go to court, you need to have evidence and you need evidence of process. You need evidence to show that you are taking accessibility seriously. I mean, you, you can go into court and say, well, oh, it's terrible, we found this problem. We're fixing it now, we've been told about it, but we, we're conscientious about our accessibility. We do this testing, it's slipped through, but look at all this testing we've done before. Here's, here's the proof. This is how you get proof out of these automated tools and out of even the manual tools. So this is from a manual audit to say that this was done, was done by this individual outside of your business, so inside of DA, and it was done at this time. This is what we were testing. So what I'm trying to talk about here is the difference between quality assurance and quality control. So with quality insurance, we're still talking about quality management, but we're focusing on providing confidence that the quality requirements have been fulfilled. With quality control, still part of quality management, but we're focusing on fulfilling quality requirements. So it's the difference between managing the process of quality and actually doing the test. So an audit is quality control. Having an audit process and tools and traceability of that audit is the quality assurance. So in the same way you would, if you were building, making widgets in a factory, you'd be using ISO 9000 to define your quality process. That quality process would include instructions in terms of how you test, how you deal with faults when they occur, how you trace those faults being corrected in the products. The same way in, in digital audits on digital assets, you still want to have a process by which you formalize how you do those testing, who's doing that testing, what you do about the issues when they arise, how you trace that those issues have been corrected. And it's that quality assurance part that you need when you go to court. Because you know quality control has gone wrong, that's why you're being sued. So the question is, can you show that the quality control that you've used within that process actually works. So the definition that I have there comes from the ASQ, which is an international organization for quality assurance people. So um, Juan was just talking about the IAAP, which is the accessibility equivalent of the ASQ. ASQ is general quality assurance. Um, IAAP is specifically accessibility. It's the same thing, you have a quality system in which side you have quality insurance and part of that quality insurance is the quality control. So I talked about the activity log. The other thing that goes to the activity log, of course, is the history that's saying we want to know that when were these tickets created, when were they modified, um, who, who modified the ticket and when. And again, when you go to court, you need to say, well, when we tested it, we didn't have the problem. 
we tested at these times by these people. And you kind of need this information out in that external third party tool that you as a company don't have access to. So you can't go and modify this information. So just like when you're watching sort of CSI programs on TV, where you want traceability of evidence, that's what you get out of having a, a reporting tool, an external third party reporting tool. And I'm using, since I'm in DA, I'm using ours as an example. There are others out there like this. Next thing, of course, if you're trying to provide traceability of what you've done, it's not just the audit you're doing in the reports that are coming back, it's the communication you're having between team members during an audit, between team members who are maybe perhaps doing, doing the digital audit itself, and some people may be working on the desktop, some people may be working on the mobile, you may be doing lived user testing. And all of those people need to talk about the issues that are arising, and again, you want to capture that in a way that if necessary, you can take to court and say, yeah, we talk about it, we think about these issues, this is what we actually say. So again, you're wanting that level of internal communications to get recorded. And this is our example within side DA. So we have two ways of doing communications. You can talk between individual team members and you can talk to clients because again, you want the traceability to, from the auditor back to the client to say, we found these issues and you said, oh yes, we're going to fix them in this, in this particular way, or we're going to fix them in, or we're going to um, retest in a particular way. So again, we need to trace those external comments, the same way we track internal comments within the system to get gain, again, evidence to take to court. Next thing, again, if you could test something, you need to know what you tested. Um, you, so you want to know what the page was like when you tested and it's, you want to visually see what the page looks like because these days, a lot of web pages are built from JavaScript. They're not just built from HTML. So just saving the HTML from the page isn't enough. You need to see what the rendered page looks like. And because the rendered page doesn't necessarily tell you what the tab order is on that page. It doesn't tell you what it's going to sound like in the screen reader. And from the previous presentation, we just had the issues they were finding where they had a, they had a complex form where the error messages were appearing on the form, but they were appearing in the wrong place for the screen reader you won't catch that with just a screenshot. So you need a system like we have here where we identify common components in the system. And again, we're logging those into the system. We're copying this, the screenshot, we're copying the source code. So actually we're copying the rendered code rather than the source code. So we actually know what we tested. And it's really important on a, on a live site. Um, if you're just in the development phase, it, you can have a test server and then things are nice and stable. Often, particularly when you come along to audit a website that's live, it's a living document and it changes from day to day and it has to because it's supporting a business. So again, you need to know what you're going, what you set out to test and then you need to take the same screenshot and the recording every time you find an issue in case there's a difference between them. Again, to provide that evidence for court. Then the next one that we have here is we need to track what technologies were being used and who was actually making those changes and when. So you need to have some process control of the documentation. So we, did, we need to know who's, who is responsible for anything at a particular point in the life cycle of a particular ticket. The ticket is going to be raised by an auditor, it might get reviewed internally by the audit company itself. Then it goes out to the client. The client's going to review it. Maybe they'll send it on to their, sub, to their developers because perhaps they don't do their own development. The developers are going to review it, make comments, try and fix things. Comes back to the development, comes back to the auditing company to reaudit. You might go through that cycle a few times before you can finally close down the ticket and say finished. And again, if you're going to take, if you're going to take your audit process to court to show how well you work, you're going to have to show that process and operation. You're going to have to show that life cycle being followed. And again, that's what you get out of backend system that's doing that individual tracking of tickets all the way through and taking, taking the life cycle step by step and tracking it through. So on the left there, just, just out of this, uh, whilst I pulled this little bottle up, 
you need obviously when we when you raise a ticket you also need to record very precisely what technologies were actually used and how you went about doing that testing and how you can repeat that particular issue and again most automation tools most tracking tools are designed to capture this so why does it matter well one of the court cases that are going on in canada now and it's just finished, I think, closing arguments were about two or three weeks ago, is Greco versus Air Canada. So this is one of these human rights court actions I was talking about, where Mr. Greco is a blind screen reader user and he's suing Air Canada because he couldn't book his flight to San Francisco online because when he tried to navigate the website with, his key, with the keyboard, he couldn't do it. And this court case has been on the go now for something like five years. It takes a really long time to get through the Human Rights Court. And one of the issues that we have with this particular case, and I've been involved on Mr. Greco's side, is evidence of testing. Air Canada said, it said what I was saying earlier, which is we do a lot of this testing. We, include, we employ this external third party company to do our audits. Here's evidence of our testing. When you start looking at that evidence, you realize it's not independent. A lot of it is record is information that's coming out of Air Canada itself. None of it is time stamped. None of it's identifying who did what on what day. So the evidence that's arriving in court is not is not supporting Air Canada in the way that it could have done. If it was coming in in the format that you've seen on our own tool, if you look if it was content that was coming in on Axe, for example, that's what recording where at least you got date and time stamped, you'd have something. The information that's arrived in there coming in from Air Canada, they simply don't have that in place. They have simple spreadsheets. They have simple, simple screenshots. But those screenshots aren't coming from an independent third company, they're just being supplied directly from Air Canada. And they come a bit unstuck in court as a result. On the other side, um, with Mr. Greco, he employed third, part, uh, third party testers to come in and do lived user testing for him to demonstrate that it's not just him that would have issues with the website. Um, his third party people, again, didn't have a tool to record what they were doing in terms of lived user testing. And there's been challenges over how they did their testing because again, this is the quality of the evidence that's coming to court. And this isn't the only court case like this, where people are challenging the quality of the evidence that's coming in as to whether it's genuinely true. So we have to go back and look at the tools that we use to support audit. We're going to spend a lot of money auditing, auditing, uh, auditing websites and remediating websites. We want to be able to prove that we've done it. If you're coming along and you can't access the website and you need to go to court, you need, your, you need to get your auditors to be able to do the same thing. They need to have evidence of testing as well. So on both sides, the quality of the evidence, the quality of the tracking of data is really, really important. And it's going to be interesting to see where, where the Air Canada case actually goes in the end. So um, I've got this far through. I should maybe explain a little bit why I'm talking about this today and why I ended up helping Mr. Greco. I've been working in accessibility for a very long time now, um, back from the late 90s. Um, part of that time was spent doing a master's and then a PhD in assistive technology. Um, the paper on screen is the system model of accessible adaptive hypermedia, which was one of my papers for W4A back in 2008. What that paper is, is looking to see how do you make a, a website adapt to match user need and preference. We see that today, it's called overlays. This is different because it's starting from saying, how do you adapt design intent? But this is back in about 2008. Now I'll talk a little bit more about this process as we go further, further in, but it, it's why, it's where my interest in accessibility comes from. Um, my background is, is real-time software engineering. 
And by the 90s, I was working for Nokia Research in Helsinki, looking at adaptive user interfaces for Nokia. And that slowly turned into, um, into an interest in accessibility through family issues. And I ended up in going into doing a master's and a PhD in assistive tech. And I took my knowledge of adaptive interfaces with me. So my background is much more software engineering than it is UX. So my approach and my view of the world is a little bit different. And you'll see that come up a little bit later on. So coming back to our silver bullets. I say as in we have silver bullets have many names. And we're talking about automated remediation, we're talking about adaptation in youth using AI, and that's typically overlays. We're talking about pre-built pre user profiles, then automated accessibility testing, which we touched on slightly, automated regression testing, which I've spoken about, and accessibility metrics. And we're talking about that score of 73, and what does it actually mean? Well, to try and do something with that number, we need to be quite structured in how we do manual audits. If we want to give a number for a man the manual part of an audit, like we do for automated testing, we need to be quite precise in terms of what we mean by the issues that we find on a web page. So within DA, the way that we work, we have a set of individual checkpoints that we apply to an audit. And this is checkpoint G GT lang 002. And it's checkpoint, um, which would be language of page, so three, actually it should be 3.1.2, but I'm going to say 3.1.1 down there, 3.1.2 in um, WCAG. And it's describing the issue that would be, could be raised where the words on a page don't match the rest of, uh, or, or foreign words and haven't been tagged for a screen reader. If you don't apply language attributes to foreign words, for example, um, if you have a language switcher and your language switcher says oh, Francais and Deutsch and you don't have the French tags around the Francais and the German tags around Deutsch, you'll hear some nonsense come out of a screen reader. So even just on a little language switcher, you tend to have to use, use those old lang language tags. It's not something that an automated tool can pick up very easily because it, it's not very good at identifying diff different languages on the same page. It has to be told what, la what language the page is in. So for that one, for this particular issue, we're saying that it's unrecognized, in this particular issue, it's very specific. It's the unrecognized language code and the language attribute. So this is, so number 315 is, is specific to when the language code you've given is not an official language code. So if somebody's mistyped something. So we're saying what the severity is, what the complexity is, the type of issue it is, which is about structural elements, the category, which is readable content, the subcategory of human language, then you get a detailed description of that checkpoint, then the, an impact statement in terms of how it impacts one disabled users, then detailed remediation that goes with it. And if you've ever used ACTS and dropped out the spreadsheet from, from the, the, ACTS, the automated ACTS tool, you'll see something very similar. But this is at a manual level rather than at an automated level. And because we had it down to these individual checkpoints, and very detailed checkpoints that break down beyond the success criteria, we can then calculate better a score for the manual part of our audits. Because we can say precisely within 312 what that particular is, issue is. So how do you calculate that score? And the answer is you would need to look at the breadth of accessibility issues that there can be on a particular page, and then which ones we actually find manually. So the score of 70% here is 70.1%. 70, 70 it's saying 70.1% of all of the issues that could have been found on this, in, on this particular page passed. So, so just under 30% of them failed. So it's not 30% of all of the success criteria you might have that, you, that we have inside WCAG, but 70% of the ones that are relevant to the content on that particular page. So if it's a page about forms, it's going to be more about the check, it's going to be much more about form handling. If it's data in this table, it's going to be much more table handling and data handling. 
So the success criteria that you might apply to the content depends on, depends on the page itself. So we end up being able to say, well, 30% of the success criteria that should be passing on this page are failing. So it's not necessarily a measure of the number of issues that you have on the page, but it's the breadth of problems that you have on the page. As that breadth of problems that's really going to affect you in terms of how you go fix the issue on, on here. Because that means there's not just one success criteria, it's a range of success criteria which might affect different skill sets within your developers in terms of what you need to fix. So I'm going to tell you very quickly how bad the situation is. We also tell you how many issues you have for each of these success criteria, which you see below, but you want to know how many or what the breadth of the issues are across that particular page, yeah, across that particular component of your site. And if we can calculate that, we can calculate that issue for a particular, say, calculate that score for an individual page, we can recalculate that score. So what you want, again, when you're auditing, if you want to take, take this audit and take it to court, is you want to say, well, those are the issues that we had, then we fixed these, then we fixed these, then we fixed these, and then we were we got to the point where we were compliant. And something's happened since, but look, we got to compliance. So you want to be able to see an improvement over time. You want to see those fixes coming in. So you want to be able to see that little simple graph that we have on the right-hand side there. So you can have multiple data points on there over time to see the page improving as each iteration of remediation on your website resolves issues. So again, it's another way of providing evidence to court to show that you do actually fix issues. And even if it's a large complex page where you've had a lot of issues, you fix them over time, and here's the proof. So you can say what date we tested on, what the score was on those particular days. So I was just talking about manual testing. Then we talked about automated testing before. Um, just talking about automated testing, when we're talking about automated testing, there's that sort of automated testing that an auditor will do for an individual web page. But the reality is you really want to be able to crawl and test and report across the entire website. Most websites are not manually audited page by page. If you have a 500 page website, you're not going to manually inspect 500 pages. You're going to inspect a sample set of those pages. But you really want automated testing to run across the whole width of that. So again, in terms of the tools that we want to use and the results that you want to, to provide, you want to be able to crawl that website and find as many pages as you can and run those tests. And if you have a live website, you perhaps want to periodically run through that testing. And if you've got somebody like Site Improve, that's where they, what they try to specialize in is that crawl test and report. The scroll test and report just of the automated, automated part of an audit. Um, then there's pages, screens, and components. One of the challenges with automated testing is that you have, comp you have the same components on multiple pages because websites are built from templates. So one of the things that we try to do here at DA is separate out a page into that which is unique to the page and that which is a common component that appears on multiple pages of so typically the header and the footer, and then maybe other similar com smaller components that appear on multiple pages, maybe simple forms, um, simple widgets. And you really only want to see those automated test results once for each of those elements. So you can't just crawl and test an entire website. You have to understand the structure of that website as well. So, Again, in terms of the quality of the results you're going to give to court, you want to be able to say, well, the header has these problems. The main body of each of these pages has these problems. The footer has these problems. This contact form that we keep using, the sign-up form that we keep using has these particular problems. You don't want to see the same problem again and again and again in the reports. It doesn't help. Automated testing also allows us to do PDF checking on the fly. So if you have a website with 2,000, and seriously, the websites have more than 2,000 PDF documents on them, to have a tool, again, automated testing that will periodically go through and check all of those PDFs against workout success criteria to give you 
an on, ongoing score to show that you're checking for those, checking for those, checking those scores, checking for those issues on your PDFs on your website and remediating. So all of that with that periodic revalidation is really where the automated testing comes in and helps and it's part of our, part of our um, offering is with it within DA. The thing about automated testing is it doesn't catch an awful lot. Um, we spend a lot of time and money talking about automated testing in, in, a, in the accessibility world. And the reality is it doesn't catch a massive number of issues. It catches very important things, but it catches somewhere between 15 and 30% of the issues on any individual page. It catches very important ones and isn't, you'd be silly not to use automated testing, but that's kind of the level it gets to. High quality automated testing will touch on 50% of the issues. It'll say, fine, maybe if you're lucky about 30% of them. So how do you improve on that? Another way that we can provide ourselves with a silver bullet, a better way of, of identifying issues on the website is through guided heuristics based testing. And we heard some of that this morning already as well. So with, guide, with guided testing, it's a structured traceable approach to manual testing. So you let the automated testing run. And based on that, you can make intelligent questions given to an auditor or not necessarily that skilled in order to either. If we take something really simple like the page title, the page title appears in the tab on the browser. The automated testing can tell you whether you have a title, only a human being can tell you whether it's correct. So you can ask some simple questions to say, this is what we think the page title is. Is that a good page title for this page? Is it in the right language for the page? Because if you have a multilingual website, one of the things that gets forgotten about is page title. So they we, go, we go and change all of the content on the page. We forget about that tab. So you can ask a simple set of questions that have just check boxes, yes, no. And from that, we can determine what the issues are on the page and then raise tickets aut automatically. So in other words, you can, you can improve on automated testing by asking questions of, of a human being, asking the human to come and do things on the web page that the automation can't do. You see that in our tools, you'll see that in other people's tools as well. In each case, it's building on that automated testing. And as a result, it kind of de-skills the manual task a little bit so that if you have an in-house accessibility team, they may not have 20 years of accessibility experience, but given automated testing, with some guided testing, they can probably run that guided testing. So in the same way that you can crawl an entire website, you can take a much larger sample of pages on that website and run it through guided testing on a period of periodic basis to improve the understanding of your website and catch those errors as they come up in that live, living, breathing website. And that consistency that you get through that will reduce the accessibility, well, well increase, increase the accessibility score you get out of the audit, audit reporting tools, as you'll get the consistency across the site. Because that guided testing is running more often, the issues you find will be caught across a broader range. So the elephant in the room that I keep avoiding really, <laughs> Uh, when we talk about silver bullets is accessibility overlays. So it's going to be companies like Accessibility, Audio Eye and the likes where they're providing tools to try and remediate, uh, remediate, uh, remediate um, issues on a, on a live website. So you attach some JavaScript to the page and it tries to adapt that page to better map to the users need some preferences. That's to say that's something I was doing back in 2008. The challenge with overlay technology is it's looking from the outside in. So it doesn't understand the designer's intent of the page that limits what those tools could do. And a lot of the complaints about overlays come from, partly come from how they're marketed, 
but partly it's just an it's the optimism how do i put this politely people get very optimistic over what technology can do especially ai and we're very keen to believe the PR from the AI companies in terms of how they can resolve issues. And they can do a lot. They can, they can really help adapt a website to match user need and preference. So you can come up with a menu, say, well, I want to change my text size. I need to change a different background because of, because of, my, because of my mobility. I need, I need a slightly different way for the keyboard to work, please. And they can try and adapt the environment. What they can't do is fix real errors inside the system. Um, they can't create the, certainly not at the moment, they certainly can't create reusable alt text for images. Alt text for images depends very much on context, and images are generally there to support text. So you have to understand the text, understand the image, and how that image is being used to support the text, and AI just isn't there yet. So image support doesn't work with these tools. So just to say that all of these things I'm talking about in terms of silver bullets, the one that we generally think of as a silver bullet is, is overlays. Yes, overlays are an issue, but they can do some, they can do some good. And I'll just talk about that in a moment. Because we have to think about, well, where do we go now? We, if we can document a manual audits, we can, make them much more precise with their checkpoints. We can run automated, automated scans to find issues. We can improve on those automated scans with some guided testing. We can sometimes apply an overlay perhaps to help people adapt, adapt to user interface to better match a particular individual, a particular, a particular learning style that people have in terms of reading information on a page. There's many things that you could potentially do. But what do you do next? And the answer has to come back to documenting design intent so that we can test not just the rendered content that you see on the page, but the actual design intent behind it to make sure that what's being built makes sense for, for um, assistive technology. And that means we need to test the design patterns that are then being used to implement that design intent. So maybe we're getting as far as we can in terms of looking at an individual web page. We maybe need to start looking more at the design documentation for a web page. Maybe that's where audits should be. And if you think about, well, that sounds a bit like wireframes and testing wireframes and auditing wireframes. Yes, yes, that's exactly where it goes. Because we need to understand the information that's being placed on the on onto a page, we have to understand how that information has been broken up and navigated, because we need to know the, the structure of a web, the structure of information in terms of how we navigate and how many clicks it takes to get anywhere, because that impacts on cognitive accessibility. So maybe we've done as much as we can in terms of saying, well, there's a rendered visual two-dimensional web page that we read the HTML and it, and sorry, let's start that a little bit again. Maybe that's where we start. I say at the moment we have where we say, well, there's there's our piece of HTML. We make sure it will it will talk its content on on the screen reader. It will zoom nicely inside the magnifier and still be understandable when inside that magnifier. Maybe we need to go further and understand the information that's on the page to understand the structure of that page so it can be restructured depending on cognitive, cognitive impairment and on the, on the context of use, whether you're on a mobile device or a, or a desktop. So we maybe have to start understanding information more. So I'd suggest if all of the other things that we've been do, talking about were, were working, the next step is design intent. It's what does the designer actually mean? What is that menu supposed to actually do? Where is it supposed to take you? What task is it really supporting? Because perhaps we need design patterns that are task-based, task-based patterns that work across multiple pages. And maybe that's where we need to be testing next. And if you're going to do that, 
you need to understand the page, you have to understand the content a little bit more. And the image on the right hand side of the page here is from my Cisna 5 layer model. So this is what I was talking about earlier, back in 2008, where we think about the information on the page as an abstract model between the the semantics of the information that we're trying to provide to the user, how we navigate through that information and potentially different ways that you can adapt it depending on, on the user. And then based on that information, we can then look at the output of that rendered content and work out how to adapt it better for assistive tech in a particular instance. But you kind of have to understand how the semantics work how the navigation works and how the designer expected that content to adapt in different environments. And perhaps that adaptation is something we never think about in our designs at the moment. Maybe that's really the limiting factor of what we can do in terms of accessibility. Maybe that's where we should be looking is in look, when we design a web page, we have to think about how do we adapt content? How would you describe information in a way that it can be rendered in different ways? So what are the next silver bullets if, we have, if we've already got detailed, we have detailed manual audits, we have, we have, we have automated testing, we have guided testing. Where do we go next? The answer is probably in, in terms of that technology, the next silver bullets, it's going to be, silver bullets are going to be about location-based services, I suspect. That's where the world is going. Um, so it's going to be, how do you actually make mapping technology work? How do we test whether that mapping technology actually works? The number of websites we go to where everybody uses Google Maps <laughs> to show you how to get to their store, yet you start tapping into that website with, with keyboard and you hit Google and it just goes mad because Google Maps is not accessible at all. The only pins on Google Maps that are accessible are the paid pins on the left-hand side. If you're on desktop, the desktop version of Google Maps, the pins on the left-hand side, the paid pins, you can tap to the paid pins inside a map. Non-paid pins don't get spoken about. The background information, there's no way to navigate. And it gets worse because the next thing they're launching now is AR Maps. And we're struggling to do 2D maps. And somehow we have to work out how does a screen reader interpret what we can see on screen there. You can see the map down at the bottom of the pit, in the bottom of the screen inside, inside the mobile device. You can see the name of the street, and you see a set of arrows above. And you can see you can see background content and other little buttons on there. How do we actually make that work? for somebody who's using assistive technology. And the work on that is really only just getting going. But my guess is the next set of silver bullets are gonna be people selling us technology that allegedly fixes this. So in the same way that we have overlays now, there's gonna be overlays for this sort of technology. There's gonna be test tools for this kind of environment for accessibility. And why all of that matters is the ADA in the US now. Already businesses are getting demand letters about mapping. The ADA doesn't make a distinction between tabular data, text, and pretty pictures and maps. Everything is just, it's just content on the screen and it has to be accessible. And when you end up with a web page, in this case, for this is for a um, realtor. Who, who build subdivisions and they have a set, of search, a set of search results on the left and they have a map on the right and a set of pins for, the, for information about the community around where they're building. And they're getting demand letters and say, well, that's not accessible. No, no, it probably isn't. So how do you go about doing it? So there's gonna to have to be design patterns that work for assistive technology. There's going to have to be test tools that can come and test the page and test the right-hand side of here. The left-hand side, we don't have to test for accessibility. We don't have to test the right-hand side yet. 
no, no, we don't. And I think that's really where the technology is going to go. That's where the silver bullets are going to come from. It's going to be, how do you test for a map in 2D? How do you test for 3D maps? How do you test with AR? In, term, in terms of the technology that's there when it's either running on desktop or whether it's running on mobile or it's running on embedded technologies, we're going to have to find, find ways in the same way that we've built, built all those automated tools and the, aud the, the auditing tool itself, the audit recording tool, we'll have to take all of this into account. And I think that this is where the next set of technology is going to come from, the next set of silver bullets. And it's simply because that's where the demand letters are landing. Because the stuff on the left, we kind of know about and we know how to argue about it. The stuff on the right should be accessible and you can actually build in an accessible way. The example we have here is actually genuinely accessible. But generally speaking, you, know, you throw Google Maps at something and it's not. So there's, there's going to have to be ways to design for this, and there's going to have to be ways to test for this. And there's going to have to be success criteria to test for this. Because if we want to say that this is accessible, what success criteria in WCAG match a two-dimensional navigable map? So first to summarize, I'd say, well, there definitely aren't any real silver bullets, but there are lots of technologies that are really helpful. And maybe if they're not silver bullets, maybe they're slightly polished at least. And we can certainly provide ourselves with some our body armor with the way that we approach our accessibility, and the way that we run our audits and the way that we record the information on those audits. So we, to make sure that we're recording to see what we're doing, what we're testing for, how we're testing, when we tested, what the results were, how we remediated, when we retested. And if you have that information in there, with the automation to help us, with the guided testing to help us, then we're in a reasonable state to start looking at design intent and looking at patterns of intent in terms of the next set of technologies to move forward on this because especially as you move into AR the interfaces are going to get much more complex and you really do have to understand the design intent of an AR environment to test it. Just if I go back just slightly there. As you have to understand the intent of that page to have any chance of adapting to user needs and preferences. Because there's ways and means that you take that information and make sure all of the all of the information that's on there can be provided to the user, but can be provided in a way that's actually usable at the time. I mean, it's this difference between accessibility and usability. But if then, if you look at the workout success criteria, things have to be accessible, but they also have to be usable. If you look at chapter five and workout on conformance. The success criteria that we have for accessibility is followed by a strict rule in section 5.2.4 inside WCAG, which says you can pass all of the success criteria and provide all the information that's up on the screen, but it has to be usable by people with standard assistive technologies. So it has to be understandable and usable by somebody who's using a screen, somebody who's using a screen magnifier with this device, with this app. So we have to think about how we're going to do that. So the examples I've been giving today in terms of the auditing tool come out of, out of our aligned tool at DA. You'll see similar tools elsewhere, maybe not with all of the features I've talked about today, but at least for some of them, where we're trying to record the tool, we're trying to record the page that we're on, we're trying to record who's doing the work and when. And the summary report for that is currently on the right-hand side of the screen here. But it can only support the silver, the silver bullets that we have, which is very, very basic. So it's, it's the order tool that we have. It's that automation. It's the, it's, it's the, let's say it's the automation. It's the guided testing. And going forward, it's that design intent and patterns of intent. 
So it's um, 12.48, I'll stop at this point for questions. Okay, uh, we have one question so far. Can you think of any example where adaptation based on user behavior improved accessibility? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, when you when adaptation to user behavior, yes, you get that, uh, you get that sometimes in games as well. Um, if you have somebody with MS, for example. Um, it's possible to change how a keyboard works. If you if you track somebody who's typing and you've got problems on a keyboard, you can spot it. You can spot typos. If somebody's typing text, you know what the you know what a QWERTY keyboard looks like. You can look at the errors on a QWERTY keyboard and identify typos that are coming from a finger sliding off one key and hitting another. So you can tell whether you need to start applying. A, a virtual key guard onto a keyboard by looking at the keyboard errors that you get. You can also notice how people are touching devices and, and how often they're touching and whether the fingers are bouncing around on the surface. Or the fingers are shaking a little bit when they're holding a mouse. You can actually spot a lot of that. And you can then actually auto adapt based on that. There, there's a lot of research in that area. If you want to find that kind of sort of unique user interface, adaptive, adaptive approach, the place to look would be on the ACM digital library, that's acm.org. ACM is the Association for Computing Machinery. It's the professional association for software engineers like myself. It's the people who run a lot of the accessibility conferences around the world. Um, they, have a, they have a digital library of, of accessibility research. And if you are searching on their digital library, you'll find a lot of the sort of adaptive techniques. And people have been trying these adaptive techniques for a long time. They're actually try, trying to track what people are doing on keyboards, uh, using eye trackers to see whether to try and catch errors on screen, to see where you're making a mistake so you can improve next time around. There's actually been a lot of work done in that area. Um, there was some work done even on a mouse. Uh, there's a special version of mouse software that was invented by IBM back in 2003, where they adapted a mouse to make it work better for people with um, mobility impairments. Where again, the mouse, is, the mouse is looking at how you're using the mouse, looking at the issues that you're getting and adjusting the timing that go with the buttons and adjusting how fast you speed up and slow down as you move the mouse. So there's actually been a lot of work done in this area. Uh, there's not a lot of commercial stuff that you see, but there's been a lot of academic research. Yeah, another question. Uh, Aya John Miller Perez asks, when is audio description needed? Uh, audio, when, when do you need audio description? Anytime the user requires it. Um, you, you think about all the different situations that you can have. You, if you have audio description with the, you would need for video, you're going to need for animation on a screen as well. If you're in a game environment, you need to understand what's happening inside the game. That's a kind of, a, a kind of description as well. Um, and you may not necessarily be disabled. It may be a situational disability where you need descriptive environments because you're trying to use a device in a bad environment where you can't see the screen very well. You know, you, and therefore you need to have content that's operating in front of you described to you. Simply because you're using a mobile device and you're in an environment where the grounds are not very stable because you're on transport or you're in just poor lighting conditions, or you may get, you don't want to be distracted so much by what, what's actually on screen and you need that audio description because you're driving heavy machinery and you don't want a visual interface. You need to have audio description of everything that's actually happening on screen. So we tend to think of audio description just in terms of video. That's not really true. It's true of any time there is movement on screen, when there's changes of content on screen, the descriptions of those changes all sort of come through as some form of audio description. Does that answer your question or did you have some other idea in mind? So 
So Sonia Lynn is letting us know that that's it. Uh, that question was originally posed by Aya John Miller Perez. So if you have uh, any further clarification, please do post it in the Q&A for us. Um, for Excellent. myself, uh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, Anna. Uh, for myself, I just wanted to know, Bob, um, given what you've just explained and the kind of the extensive yeah. ability for us to uh, test and audit in a way that is really clear, mm -hmm. why do you think that the accessibility silver bullets are so persistent? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. Let's go back to that first slide. Far enough. So there are because of the consequences that there are for accessibility, and those consequences are getting worse with time as more uh, as more legislation comes along. Um, it's becoming there's been more and more expensive to fail in accessibility in terms of court cases. It's being expensive to remediate because it's just not enough. There's not enough developers around. There's not enough tools around. You need to be really efficient in how you do your audits. And it just drives people into trying to find quick solutions. And I, I totally understand the situation. If you, have, if you have a website and you've got a thousand, a thousand page website and somebody comes along and tells you it's not accessible. Now you've got to try and work out, well, one, is it true? Two, how are you going to fix it? Three, who the heck is going to fix it for you? And how are you going to get it done in a reasonable time? Of course, people reach for silver bullets. I would in that situation as well. I mean, for silver bullets, you really just mean you, you, you're looking for easy, quick fixes because you're trying to fix your website because you sell widgets, you don't sell accessibility. And it's not core to your business. You just want it working and you look for fast solutions. And that's why people reach for overlays, for example. And it's why people reach for automated testing and you sort of become obsessed with the numbers and automated testing because you think there's a quick solution. If, we, if, we, if I can just get to 70% inside of Lighthouse, I don't get to 65% inside of Site Improve, then, then at least I've proved I've got some accessibility. And all of those tools are helpful and useful. None of them are real silver bullets. They don't make your website really accessible. They don't ensure that it's really usable. And the previous speaker was talking about usability testing and the difference between having live user testing and having an audit, just having an auditor looking at the success criteria. And so silver bullets tend to hit the auditor part, they tend to hit the automated testing. Silver bullets tend not to pick up on expensive things like lived user testing. So yeah, it's, there's, there's really a good reason for it. And it's why Auditors themselves try to minimize the amount of time they spend on an individual audit as well. Because again, there's a shortage of developers, there's a, there's a vast array of clients. So yeah, there, there's reason for it. There's reason enough for it, there really is.